that through baptism makes us partakers of the divine nature. It draws us into a closer relationship with God than even Moses on top of Mount Sinai enjoyed. That's dramatic, but it also shows the profound convergence, the resonance, the deep agreement that you find between Jesus on the one hand and the Gospels and Paul in the epistles. It's a, farce, a false dichotomy. Oh, and it's, it's very common. Maybe a simple way to summarize how I used to think of it and then address this is that I used to think of that before the cross it was about my righteousness and after the cross it was about the righteousness of Christ. Right. I was saved before by my righteousness Afterwards, I pointed to his righteousness. You just paraphrased Philippians 3 because there really is a true sense in which, you know, in the Old Testament, the ancient Israelites properly treasured the word of God, yeah. especially the law of God, written with the finger of the Lord on these tablets of stone. I mean, what more could you want? Well, the word made flesh dwelling among us. He's assuming what is ours, human nature, to give us what is his, divine nature, divine sonship. And so Saul, now Paul, says in Philippians, whatever I counted as gain, I now count as loss, refuse in comparison to having Christ. So it is no longer I who lives, he says to the Galatians, but Christ who lives in me. And to me, that is another breakthrough, because Christ didn't come you know, in order to obey the law, suffer, die, and rise in order to get us off the hook. So we don't have to obey, although it's a great thing to do. We don't have to suffer, but we will if we don't have enough faith. No, Christ doesn't come as a substitute. In the Catholic tradition, following Paul, he comes as a representative. He, you know, Christ comes and assumes what is ours, human nature, to give us what is his, divine nature, so that he obeys, not in order to get us off the hook, to exempt us from obedience, but to empower us with his spirit, to reproduce in us nothing less than his own divine sonship, his own love, his own willingness to suffer, die, and rise. That notion of Christ the representative is much closer to Paul than Christ the substitute. We participate through the spirit in Christ. And so the spirit comes to us, and especially in the church, through the sacraments, as Paul taught me, we end up receiving nothing less than Christ's own divine sonship. That's, I mean, that, that's cool. Yeah, <laughs> scratching the surface, too. I mean, you're, 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 you're uh, getting into, in many ways, sort of thinking that maybe our average viewer is not used to thinking in terms of the depth of what you're talking about. True, but Paul's writings do that, because on the yeah. one hand, he's very practical, he's very personal, and yet suddenly he's very profound and very passionate. I can relate because, you know, sometimes people who are passionate aren't very profound. And people who are profound are boring. You know, but if the truth grips you, how can you not be passionate about the truth? And what is more passionate, you know, what is worth getting more passionate about than this divine grace? I want to throw an idea out and see what your, th your thought on this is. Um, Paul's emphasis on the law. Yeah. <clears throat> Often I've found in the 15 years I've been a Catholic and I've unexpectedly have spent most of those years dealing with converts. Uh, that wasn't necessarily my choice, but that's what God is. God's choice. Okay. And what I've often found is that often converts, after they come to the church, often the focus of what they emphasize is because it is either a counteraction to what they used to focus on. That's right. It's compensatory. You know, so yeah. you have in James focusing on one thing, maybe because of where he came from, right. is that why Paul focused on the law because, the issue of the law, because he came from such a high-level Pharisee? I think you're right. I think the reason why Paul focuses on how we are not under law, but under grace, is because he, more than any, any other contemporary of his, saw himself under law, and that, that was his that's the source of his identity, that was the source of his righteousness, and that's how he understood mm -hmm. grace. I mean, we didn't deserve God giving us the law, and yet he, he spoke the word, he wrote the word, he's delivered his will to us. I mean, this is undeserved favor. That's grace in the Old Testament. But when you discover that the word is now made flesh, that the Father sends the Son to give us the Spirit to adopt us and make us members of a divine family, then suddenly the graciousness of a law that we didn't deserve is exceeded by infinity, by the graciousness of the Son who becomes the servant in order to make us servants nothing less than divine sons. It would seem then that you know, those that put such an emphasis on really Paul is all about the law, 
to, to really to see that in its context is to look at it from the, where he came from. That's right. And, you know, in, in the book of Romans, in chapter 7, he speaks of the law as holy, just, and good. And in Romans 8, where suddenly he just turns in the fire hydrant, there you find more references to the Holy Spirit than anywhere else in the New Testament. I think it's 17 or 18 references to the Holy Spirit in Romans 8. But the Spirit comes to us, why? In order that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, bound just to the law, but to the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit comes to us to empower us to do what we could never do in the Old Testament on our own. Keep the law and fulfill our Father's will. Talking also a bit about the importance of... Oh, man. So many things. <laughs> uh, when you interpret Paul's letters, how important it is to be looking at them through Catholic eyes. And particularly I'm thinking about like, for example, understanding Ephesians as a document about baptism. I mean, the importance of understanding Catholic things from his Catholic early church background. Right. And for you and my background, when we interpreted those letters without that. Oh, I tell you, you know, I'm getting ready to go off to Dallas and Fort Worth this weekend to join uh, Brant Petrie and Steve Ray and Michael Barber. We're going to be doing the gospel according to St. Paul. But it's the Catholic gospel. We're going to be going through Romans and Ephesians. I, now that I mentioned, I should say, yeah, it's uh, Google <laughs> fullness of truth dot org or fullness of truth. I shouldn't have said it without mentioning. Ken Zamet. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. That excellent, whole excellent, it's just a excellent, wonderful excellent, time. Excellent, excellent. But the uh, the exciting part of it is you don't have to look very far. Well, oh, here's a Catholic element. Oh, here's another fragment that is Catholic. I mean, when you really begin to get the inner logic of Romans or Galatians or Ephesians or one and two Corinthians, you realize that the reasoning that Paul is exemplifying holds together according to a logic that is Catholic. And at times, it's not just implicit. At times, I mean, he just comes right out and says things that I wondered, how would I affirm that sort of thing as, you know, yeah. a pro 1 Corinthians 11, where he speaks of how you profane not a symbol of Christ's body. You profane the actual body of Christ when you receive the Eucharist unworthily without the discerning the Lord's body. I mean, I know I had a clever response, but I would never have written those words the way Paul did. Yeah, sometimes I find myself, just as I said before, as a convert, for example, on my Deep in Scripture radio program, emphasizing those things yes. against what I used to be. But we Catholics need to read the Bible, too. I mean, I'm being That's a little right. facetious here, because Ephesians 4, that talks about the, that the apostles and the teachers and the evangelists are for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. I mean, there we see the structure in the church so that it isn't just... The leaders in the church, it's not just their job. That's right. It's us, too. And, and, and that's why it isn't like, well, we emphasize a sacramental bond as opposed to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I mean, the that's sacramental that. bond that we, we, we celebrate in the Holy Eucharist should lead us to the deepest conceivable personal relationship with Jesus, the lover of our souls, who feeds us with his body, blood, soul, and divinity. And so it isn't like, well, you have the Bible, we have tradition. We have tradition, so we can go into the scriptures with greater freedom and greater confidence and just really find the truth in its fullness. Likewise, faith and works. We have faith in order to really trust God's word and his spirit to reproduce Christ's works in us. The, the scripture that I was going to grab here real quick, which I wanted to kind of bring to a, a thought, is this, um, to me, which is one of the most powerful summaries is Ephesians 4, 22-24, which you talk about intimate relationship. Put off your old nature, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful lusts. Be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new nature created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Right. I mean, the sense of that summary of all that he wants to do to make us truly dare I use this word, divine. Yeah, I mean, you can use it. Because, I mean, some I mean, of our audience may, may be shocked that we use that word, because yeah, well, they may understand what we mean by it. Saints, doctors of the church, they do. I mean, right. the whole point as... Not gods, one, but children of God. Yes. And, and not just in name, but in reality. As, one, as 2 Peter 1, 4 says, we have been made partakers of the divine nature. Yeah. Our adoption is not a legal fiction. You know, the, God becomes 
humans so that humans can partake of this divine nature. I mean, this sounds so speculative, almost philosophical, and yet for Paul, as you point out in Ephesians 4, 20 and